You know, uh, when the Holy Spirit pick a path for you, you have to be ready to go alongside of that path and not let anything take you away from it. Even if people laugh at you or mock you, or if they bring contradiction or doubt, you have to already have an established flow with God of being established. Psalm 112 was talking about a righteous man having an established heart. That means that the heart is not being affected by people's words or situations in life, cares of this life. Nothing is taking you away from what the Lord is doing in you and for you. You're committed to the path of God. You have to do this before anything comes your way, whether it be temptation, persecution, betrayal. Betrayal is in the path of God and that traumatizes a lot of people. Um, you're not going to be able to control people's decisions. You're only going to be able to control your own decisions. So you have to set in your mind to go forth with the Lord. Even when you bring somebody into the kingdom with you, you can't bank your momentum off of them because there may be a day where they fail. They fall away. You cannot fall away as well. The raw anointing is in the path of God because the way that he chooses to take you is not going to be the same that everybody else goes. So there's a raw anointing in it. That means that you'll have to learn how to submit and immerse yourself in learning the path that God picked for you. You can't be someone that is wrestling or arguing why your life is a certain way. You have to be grateful and that comes with gratitude and thankfulness. You know, it's pride and arrogance when you don't celebrate how the Lord is choosing to make you as a person. Because remember, you're not here for yourself. Psalm 100 said that you have to remember that it was the Lord that made you and not you yourselves. It talks about serving the Lord with gladness. You know, when you think about it, if you really take time to meditate, you'll recognize how could I ever get angry at what the Lord either permits in my path or what the Lord guides me into because I'm not even here for me. I didn't even make me. You didn't make you. Like, you look at your fingers right now. You didn't make your fingers. Look at your toes. You didn't make your toes. Look at your eyeballs. Look at your ears. You didn't make none of those things. Look at even your private parts, your sexual parts, your buttocks, your breasts, your chest, your neck, your ears, your nose. None of these things that you have right now, you made it. Even your soul, you didn't make your own soul. Everything that is a part of you right now was entrusted to you by the Lord. So therefore, you are, uh, you're borrowing an investment from God. Everything that you have was sown into you by the Lord and he's entrusting it to you and he gave you a soul so that you could choose either to follow the path of why he entrusted it to you or you could uh, reject the path. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction, but straight and narrow is the way that leads to life. So the way that leads to life is straight and narrow, which means that there is not a lot of options in the God path, meaning when he's leading you, it's a single eye. That's why Matthew chapter six says that let your eye be single because it's not difficult to walk in the path of God because there's not many options and many different channels, many different roads. It's one straight and narrow path. So he brings clarity and it makes it easy for you to understand. Now you have to receive a boldness from the Holy Ghost. And this is an anointing that God puts on you to follow him. Because when you do encounter opposition or godly counsel or people discouraging you, you are going to have to already be established so that those words do not wound the soul and create doubt in the soul and cause the soul to deter from the highway of the upright. 
you'll have to already place your heart in the solid foundation of the Christ path. You cannot let people talk you out of it. You can't let people counsel you on how it should go. You can't let people determine how God deals with you. You have to also be conscious that when you're chosen and the Lord does pick a part for you to play, play and does pick a path for you to walk, there are not many people that have also done that as well. Many people are religious and have forms of godliness and they are okay with spiritualism, tradition, which makes the word of God none effect. They're okay with an illusion in their brain rather than the reality of God training them and actually giving them the authentic will of God, okay? So you, you have to identify with that, that many people are not truly saved. Many people are not safe from doing their own thing. They have on the sheep clothing, but they're wolves. Psalm chapter 25 verse 12 says that what is the man, what is the man that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he choose. Psalm 25 verse 12 says, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he choose. Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. Now Psalm 25 verse 12 is very, very important. Because we're looking at the Lord saying, when you make a decision to fear me, I'm going to choose a way that I will teach you. I'm not going to teach you just because somebody else say this is how I teach. I'm not going to teach you just because somebody else say, be careful of this doctrine, be careful of that. No, I'm going to choose the way in which I'm going to teach you, not them, not those You, I'm responding to your fear of me. And so there's a wisdom that I give to you. Fear is the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the glue for wisdom. Fear is the glue for wisdom. So there's a wisdom that God is gonna impart off of your decision to fear. When you make a decision to fear, there's a wisdom that God chooses to impart as a result of that fear. So the fear is like a payment in the spirit for God to mentor you about things that even other people do not know. The fear is an exchange. It's a seed that you sow. You get a harvest of God making you wise, meaning that you discover the person you was made to be, the personality you was made to have, the soul you was made to have. So you don't have it until you sow that seed of fear. Until you invest that quality of fear towards the Lord, now the wisdom cometh. So if you proud and haughty, I already know that, I already, man, I already been, man, you ain't not telling me that. If you got that mindset, Remember, there's wisdom that is void from you. It can't enter you because the only atmosphere for it to immerse itself in is through fear. Psalm 25 verse 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. So the Lord is choosing the way, not you. The Lord is choosing the way, not you. And so humility, a major part of it is you respecting the way that God has chosen to teach you. If he tell you not to go into a church building and sit down, that's the way that he's choosing to teach you. So you can't say, I'm going to this building because I want to go to heaven because heaven is not in that way. It's in the way that he has chosen to teach you. 
If you say, I'm going to go out and win souls, and that's not the way that he has chosen to teach you. If you go out and try to win souls, you're not going to get rewarded for that because that's not the way he has chosen to teach you. If you say, I'm going to get married and have five children, and that's not the way he has chosen to teach you. After you have the five children, that's not going to bring you into eternal life because that's not the way he has chosen to teach you. There's a powerful anointing on a person's life when they lodge themselves in the way that God has chosen to teach them. When they say, Lord, not my desire, your desire, not my path, your path, not your way. And saints, I'm going to tell you like this. I've told you this, and this is one of the most powerful things I've said, right? You can leave everything for Jesus and not love Jesus. Because there are people that leave everything for Jesus. And then when trouble comes, they actually find fault. They actually argue. They actually get angry that they have left everything. When I left all this, I did all this. Because they, there's no love. See, saints, when you do things and it's not out of love, there'll come a day where you will regret that you actually did it. Love is the only thing that produces continuance and progress and consistency and faithfulness and understanding and peacefulness. It's only through love that you could do something with cheer, gladness, confidence, never turning away, never being regretful, never being angry, never being upset. You could leave everything for Jesus and not love Jesus. You could get away from people and still not love Jesus. You can leave things behind and still hate Jesus. You have to become respectful of his path. If the Lord says, Mr. Dingle is your teacher. If you respect the Lord, not only will you receive Mr. Dingle as your teacher, but you will love Mr. Dingle. <laughs> you, you know, I just, you know, I, I have funny stuff in my head. That's all. <laughs> you will love Mr. Dingle. You would cherish Mr. Dingle. You will actually worship Mr. Dingle <laughs> because <laughs> Mr. Dingle has been sent as a specific gift to you. <laughs> Mr. Dingle will be held in high honor by you. Not only are you receiving him, but you are recognizing, wow. So God chose to pit himself in a body just so that he could reach me, teach me, and express his love towards me through this body. And saints, I want to tell you like this here. So many times you respect people that don't even do nothing for you. You respect people, they haven't even invested in you, nothing, nothing. And you still respect them. You still talk to them correct. How is it that you can meet a stranger, they give you change back in the store and you say, thank you. Or they move aside and you say, excuse me. And, and, and you're, you're so respectful and mannerable to them. How much more when Mr. Dingle is sent of God as God, God is right there saying, this represents me. Do you know what? Apostle Paul heard Jesus say, he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. What was phenomenal was Jesus didn't say, I am Jesus and you've been persecuting my people. I'm Jesus and you've been persecuting my flock. I'm Jesus and you've been persecuting those that I've sent to you. He said, I am Jesus whom you persecuted. Which means that how you have done to them, it was me. I was them. They were me in the flesh. Every word you spoke, everything you did, that was me. 
Jesus didn't tell Paul, you have persecuted my church. You have persecuted my bride. Jesus said, you have persecuted me. Jesus taught the disciples something very phenomenal. He said, he that receives you receives me. Shocking. Is King Jesus saying that when I send you to a house, if they don't receive you, dust your feet off. You know that I don't want to be there by their reaction to you. If they don't give you peace, if they don't respond to you with worship and hospitality, if they don't respond to you with honor, if they don't respond to you with respect, if they don't look at you as if you're God appearing to them, leave. That's shocking. I'm giving you the interpretation of what Jesus was saying. If you don't see them pit their faith in you, go. When you receive the path that the Lord picks for your life, all type of money start being made available to you because the money is in submitting to God's mission for your life. When you start submitting to God's path for your life, you start having dominion over demons in your mind. Whereas you will listen to a thought, you're able to say no and continually flow in the opposite direction of that thought. Not only are you able to do that, but you'll have wisdom to decree to the thought and speak to it. The impartation of a fallen angel hidden as a thought. And you'll be able to tell that fallen angel's impartation, no, you cannot live here. No, you cannot house this body. No, you cannot influence this decision of mine. When a person submits to God's path, you'll also find strength not to need people's attention. A lot of times you're needful for people's attention because you haven't submitted to God's path. You want them to accept you. You want them to receive you. You want them to be your friend. You want their favor. You want their accessibility. When you submit to God's path, you'll find that all of that level of neediness dies. You don't even care if they talk to you. You don't care if they know you. You don't care if they look at you. You don't care if they want you. You don't care if they need you. You're not even studying them no more. It goes because all of that strength was hidden in submitting to God's path for your life. Psalm 25 verse 12. He teaches him in the way that he shall choose. Romans chapter 4 verse 21. I believe that was Apostle Paul began to give a declaration about an account for Abram's life and said he was fully persuaded. He was fully persuaded. That's Romans chapter four, verse 21. Romans 420 said that he staggered not at the promise of God through doubt and unbelief, but was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God. Not only did Abraham be established, but he was meditating on the harvest of the path. What am I unlocking as I say yes to the way that the Lord wants me to go? What are the rewards that are now entering for my benefit as I am listening to the voice of the Spirit and he's leading me down the way in which he has authentically picked specifically for me? Do you really want to live your life not knowing who you really were? Do you, is, 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 would you be okay with that? Would you be okay knowing that after you leave your body, you never became what God wanted you to be? You never walked the path that he picked for you. You chose what you wanted to do, even religiously. And it wasn't God's will. Saints, I don't know about you, but it is, it is utter deception if you don't go to the person that you're saying that you want to please and you don't cry out to them and say, Lord, I want your wisdom 
at your instruction and your pathway. I want to do things your way rather than how I could do it because everybody is doing that. Anybody can put on gospel music, Christian music. Anybody can watch Christian TV. Anybody can go to a church building. And anybody can dance, sing. Anybody can preach, teach. Anybody can say the name of Jesus. But I want to be someone that is really one with you. I'm married to you and you are my husband. And you are dominating my path. You're influencing me. Even when I'm at my workplace, you're the one giving me the ideas of how to respond to that complaint from my coworker. They told the boss a lie. And I, I can respond to them with evil, but but they say good morning, and you you tell me say good morning back, and, 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 and I can't hold back and say no, I'm not gonna say good morning back because what they did to me, no no no, good morning to you, and, and because I'm not fighting them, I have a God that picked me here, and, and whatever He says goes as long as I stick to what He's saying. Now, if I get in my flesh, now I have to fight my own battle and I may lose. I may get fired. I, I might lose my position because now I step out of the cocoon, the hedge, and the serpent can bite me. But their faith, prophet, their faith, they're not really real. Why did I say hello to them and their faith? Jesus said, if everybody greets those that greet them, what is it? But when you greet someone that is ungreetable, when you love who's unlovable, that's where your rewards are. Your rewards is when you do something completely opposite than what's being done to you. Your greatest moments in life is where you display something that's not being displayed to you. Your greatest moments in life. Your greatest moments in life is when you display something that's not being displayed to you. Blamelessness is a gift to God. It's a gift to God because it's not so much about what they did. It's about what you want to do in your fruit account towards the Lord. Your greatest moments in life is where your decisions are not governed by someone else's deeds, but they're governed by your fear of God, your love for the Lord, and your desire to impress him. David desired to impress the Lord so bad that though he felt the feelings of murder, he felt the desire to slaughter Saul. He chose to preserve Saul, to impress his God. Your greatest moments is in drinking a cup that your throat doesn't want to contact. Your throat is saying, no, I'd rather some prune juice, I'd rather some, some apple juice, I'd rather some juicy juice, I'd rather some, 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 some uh, what other juice? What other juice? Fruit punch. I, I desire some Hawaiian. I desire some, uh, what? Kool-Aid or something, something. I desire some water. And the Lord saying, no. You're going to drink this. This is what I have chosen for you. When many people are livers of the flesh, when I say livers, they live out their life. They are doers of the flesh. Even when they come over into spirituality, they're still governed by the flesh. So, so they serve God with that same mentality and they never die to themselves. So even when they come over to the Lord, uh, allegedly, it seems like they have come over to the Lord, but they're still doing what they want to do. 
There's no death of self. There's no new person. It's just that same quality that you had before. Now you have translated over to the form of godliness, but you doing the same thing. And God still is not able to enjoy you. And now it's worse because tradition makes the word of God none effect. So now you done became a Pharisee in your own right. You done became a Sadducee. You done became the same people that crucified Jesus. You, became, you, you become the same people that said, crucify him. And then they still went to the synagogue that same weekend. After they said, crucify him, they still would say, Hosanna forever, we worship you. They, after they said, crucify him, they still would say, I love. You don't want to do that. You want to receive the path of God for your life. Psalm 25 verse 8 and 9 says that the meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach. The meek will he teach. And I want you to see this. The meek, the meek will he teach. That meekness is you carrying a hunger to know exactly who God made you to be and what he made you to do. And you receiving that and you embracing that and you not having anything turning you away from that or having you complain against that or dispute against that or fight against that or resist that or get angry at that or resent that or regret that. Imagine when the Lord does train you to do something and then you go through tough times and now you, you're sad that you let the Lord take you and train you. Imagine how he feels. How would you feel if you raised up a child for 18 years and by the time they get like 20, they come to you and say, I, I regret that you made me read the Bible. I regret that you made me sow those seeds. I regret, I, I shouldn't have had listened to you. I regret that you told me to disconnect from that person. That person, we used to play basketball together. I regret that. Mom, dad, I regret it. I hate that I listened to you. I hate that you told me to sanctify myself. I should have hung out. I hate that you told me not to let this be spoken. I should have spoken. You told me not to think like this. I should have thought like that. And you will be crushed. But always remember, the Bible said, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. You don't want to do that to the Lord with your life. Don't let him see you turning back. Don't let him see you looking backwards. Let him delight in you. Delight yourself in the Lord. And when he looks at you, let him feel healing that here's somebody that I can live my life through and I can continue living my life through them. They have become a drink offering. Not only one day, two days, but forever. Let God trust you. Can God trust you? And saints, God's trust in you is simply him observing your glad servanthood. A glad servanthood. Don't you want to be somebody that God can trust? He can't trust a lot of people. Look at the world today. Everybody is all about them. And it, don't you want to be someone that God could trust you? That when he look at you and say, look at her, keep in my way. Don't you want to be someone that God doesn't have to reemphasize what he wants you to do? But he knows if I give her this instruction, it's done. If I give him this instruction, oh, it's solidified. Don't you want to be somebody like that? That's why God places his power on a person. That's why they could do miracles. 
That's why they can walk in signs and wonders. Because they can be trusted. That's why God can use people in prosperity and wealth and riches because they can be trusted. When God left the garden in Genesis, he was giving Adam a chance to prove his trust. And God came back brokenhearted, hurt, saddened, disappointed. How many times is God leaving your garden in a day so that you can prove your trustworthiness and you miss it? You miss it. And then when seasons are delayed and things are not going accordingly and, and, and blessings are delayed and things are postponed, did you miss the moment to prove trustworthiness?